Hi. No, it's not quite a mailbag. Oh, I guess it kind of is. There's the real stuff there waiting for the mailbag, but uh, I just got something from Chris Jones. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, from the AC Lions in the ACT. I know what this is. Um, it's another pulse generator uh, device. He uh, claims he used some fast uh, logic to make a uh, pulser, and he wanted me to try it out. Well, I asked if I wanted to try it out on the uh, high-end Agilent scope. And let's have a look at the letter. Hi Dave, don't need any of this stuff back. However, I forgot what Logic Family chip I used and I'd like to know what chip it is in case I ever need to build another one. If you feel like doing an extreme tear down after you've tested it, appreciate finding out what chip it is. All right, I believe the chip's mounted upside down. So yeah, um, below is my best guess at the circuit. I've included an SMA cable in case you don't have one. Well, let's uh, give it a go. It runs off 3.3 to um, uh, five volts and uh, and there's nothing fancy on the schematic uh, at all, just an input uh, buffer, squares it up and then uh, feeds it into a uh, four parallel uh, inverter drivers from some form of uh, 7.4 uh, series logic family. Uh, presumably it's a very, very uh, fast one to get the incredibly fast rise times and then an output attenuator and uh, to the scope. Oh, look at that, you know, little plastic tub. That's neat, I like that, very protective. Oh, okay, here's the whole kit and caboodle. Nice, all right. This is his homemade job, by the way. It's not a, uh, it's not a thing that's hooked up to, uh... hey, look at this. Oh, there we go. Some dead bug stuff. Let's check this out. This will be nice. Beautiful dead bug style in there on uh, the uh, copper, um, uh, sheet on the bottom. It should be uh, really nice low uh, inductance and it should work uh, reasonably well, I suspect. Now let's get a real good close-up of the dead bug style construction in here. On the uh, right hand side there's the uh, coax, the black coax there uh, coming in. That's coming in from the SIG gen, hence why it, uh, you know, it can have like a bit of uh, length on the end of it because it doesn't uh, really matter. Signal integrity of that's not that critical at all, but the output is used like a rigid uh, coax here. This is actually, you know, it's it's really stiff and rigid. It's not your regular uh, coax at all, and uh, it's all, and you can see the jumper wires going over there from pin to pin as required, and uh, this really should work a treat. So, um, Chris doesn't know what the chip is, so um, we'll have to uh, desolder it afterwards. He, he said, uh, by all means, actually uh, destroy the circuit and find out what chip it is, because he doesn't recall. But, of course, we'll, uh, we won't do that first. We'll measure it first, and uh, then we'll take it apart and see what's in there. But, yeah, you can see one of the, see a couple of the surface mount resistors in there. All right, now if you go to Wikipedia and uh, you look up uh, Overkill, you will find a picture of this setup. $140,000 30, 13 gigahertz scope and a $40,000 uh, Agilent 81160 PFANG, Pulse Function Arbitrary Noise Generator. I think this might do the business. Now, I'm just <laughs> using the uh, pulse capability of it here and look what we're getting out. Uh, it's a rather unusual stepped waveform. Check that out. Now on the PFANG, what I've set up here is a one megahertz uh, frequency. I'm using uh, pulse mode. By the way, you can see that uh, pulse is on over there, pulse with continuous. So this is all the menu related to the pulse functionality and it's spot on one megahertz. Look at those 12 <laughs> decimal places. Oh, it's just brilliant. I oh, love it. And um, uh, basically we're uh, outputting a 3.3 volt peak-to-peak um, uh, -peak amplitude with a 1.65 volt offset, load impedance of uh, 50 ohms, and uh, so that should, uh, it can obviously go directly into our scope without uh, blowing it up, and it'll be perfect drive signal for our, uh, for, for our board here, for our pulse gen board. And, uh, but the reason we're getting this peculiar waveform down here is, I believe, because of this leading edge and trailing edge 
capability here and of course we can set up a whole bunch of things we can set up like the uh, pol oh, by the way the pulse width is 20 nanoseconds so it's a one one megahertz uh, signal repetition with the 20 megahertz uh, sorry 20 nanosecond pulse and we can set up all sorts of things leading edge trailing edge which will play with the amplitude the offset uh, polarity load impedance frequency coupling we've got patterns set up as well we can set up bit shapes and we can edit the bit waveforms ah oh, man fantastic I love it but anyway let's go into this leading edge here it's currently set to 50 percent 50 percent so uh, or 10 nanoseconds and if you have a look here at the waveform you'll see that of course it goes sort of you know half the time period it goes at one ramp and the other time period it goes on another ramp so let's see what happens here if we adjust our leading edge leading edge let's adjust the leading edge here that's eight nanoseconds seven oh, hey look at that beautiful so let's take that all the way down to one nanosecond that looks like it's our fastest possible thing leading edge trailing edge look at that so I'm still not sure why we're getting that little little kick there that's rather uh, rather interesting and we can wind that all the way out but uh, you can see the power of this thing to generate any type of waveform you like and we haven't even scratched the surface of this sucker really so I'm not sure why we're getting that step there again but we're certainly getting our nice fast input pulse but then boop, boop. and if you're wondering if the uh, leading edge value we've set on our PFANG one nanosecond is correct well take a look at the rise time there and uh, you can see it's uh, there's no averaging of course so to get uh, a bit more uh, accurate if there's some averaging on there but it's pretty darn close to spot on you wouldn't expect anything less for 180,000 bucks worth of kit, let me tell you. And let's see what happens if we adjust our pulse width. That's our 20 nanoseconds that we had. And if we extend it out, look, we get that, <laughs> we get that hump in there, that camel's hump. I have no idea why it's doing that. And then if we go beyond, that's, uh, so that's 20, okay? And if we 19, 18, 17, 15, and when we get to 14, 13, 12, and that's 10 nanoseconds, and then it does that. That's a one, uh, that's a two nanosecond pulse. That's as low as the PFANG will go in terms of uh, pulse width. But then there's this following pulse over here. What's going on? Aha, I think I figured it out. Look at this, continuous mode, which is what we're using, is output one equals channel one plus channel two. So clearly, channel two is doing something. So if we go into channel two, aha, pulse width. There we go. And if we get our channel two, and we adjust that pulse width on channel two, ta-da, there it is. So channel two is down to four nanoseconds, and then we can, bingo. So we can combine two different channels there that's incredibly powerful and well I don't know somebody's obviously playing around with this before I had it and uh, that's what it's set to so um, I've got to figure out how to make the output just equal to channel one and that's the problem with having such a powerful instrument like this is that you know really it's uh, um, it can do so much stuff that if you set it up incorrectly well you're, you're pretty much uh, screwed so, um, uh, and you know, it's not like a scope where there's like an auto set button you can push. Maybe there's a reset to defaults or something like that. Maybe I could do that. Um, but anyway, uh, let's have a look. We're in the continuous, so uh, we're in continuous menu here. And uh, really I need to uh, output channel one plus channel two. I need to change that. Um, strobe out. What do we got? Internal threshold. Yeah trigger out no strobe out no <laughs> trigger route oh man more options than you can poke a stick at god and we haven't even scratched the surface of this thing no wonder it costs forty thousand dollars and i do really like this graph mode you can pull up at any time if you're sick of looking at the numbers just ah show me the wave shape there it is look at that beautiful except in this case it doesn't show um, it doesn't match what we're getting on the scope because it doesn't show the second uh, coupled to channel two. So, you know, 
I'm still trying to figure this thing out, folks. And bingo, folks, I found it, of course. Duh, you just press the, uh, well, the out one here brings you into the output uh, menu. And then down in the output menu, there is, hang on, let's do it again. I think I thought I had it. I had an output menu here. Anyway, I was able to switch it off and ta-da, we have our single pulse. Oh, beautiful. All right, now we have the ability just to get a normal pulse. We've got one nanosecond rise and fall time. So, you know, let's, let's set it to our 20 nanosecond uh, pulse there and uh, we'll see what we get out. Let's plug it in, uh, plug our board in, Chris's uh, little board and uh, give it a go. And here's the setup. I've got an SMA to BNC adapter and a uh, BNC um, sex adapter there going is straight into the scope. And uh, this is what we're getting out. Um, let me switch the power off. Boom. Yeah, <laughs> switch the power back on. And uh, something is going on there. And just had a look at his circuit again. And he, of course, he's got AC coupling on the output. So let's... Uh, short that AC coupling cap on the output and uh, give it another try. Well, the AC coupling uh, fixed it, uh, of course, but um, uh, we've got the issue of uh, the PFANG is uh, clearly dull, is um, outputting that higher frequency, uh, sorry, the lower frequency signal there on top of the uh, high frequency 20 nanosecond pulse that we had in there. So we've got to fix that one too. And that fix was dead easy, of course. I just put it to square wave mode and went, ah, be done with it. Here we go. So here's our, here is our output pulse. There's some ringing, certainly some ringing there. Some overshoot and then some ringing. So that's not that great. But in terms of, you know, if we take sort of the average rise time of this thing, we are talking 250 picoseconds and, uh, Let's turn on some average in here, and if you want to know how to do that on this thing, it's a, oh, it's a pain in the ass to use, but you go into setup, then you go into acquisition, and then enable. Whoop, if you can get it right. You know, you can either use a mouse or the touch screen. It's crazy. Anyway, 16 averages. There we go. We've cleaned up our waveform a lot, and oh no, now it's, hang on. Well, of course, it's taking, you know, it doesn't know where to take that. It takes the average of that slope there for the 90% uh, mark for calculating the rise time. So 240, you know, almost 250 picoseconds there for the rise time and the four times a bit longer. All right, what I've done now is I've taken the output uh, directly from the uh, TTL chip itself. And as you can see, the uh, ring in there is uh, quite pronounced as a, that's a, for a 70 kilohertz um, signal there by the way that's 10 kilohertz down to 1 kilohertz and there you, there you go where obviously um, all that funny business you see there I love I love that effect that's the average in at work that's the 16 averages <laughs> doing that it's really uh, really quite fun to play with that so clearly what we need here is a proper uh, output attenuator proper uh, load match in to match the scope and the adapters and everything else it needs to be tweaked and uh yeah anyway it was fun to play with and with the uh output cap shorted we've clear I've, I've dropped this down to a two kilohertz repetitive uh signal okay so you can clearly see um that we've got multiple uh reflection issues in here here's the high frequency stuff all in there that's at five nanoseconds per division and then we've got the lower frequency stuff which is five microseconds per division and clearly we need a proper uh, matched fully matched output attenuator um, you know that's a match to our scope input and all our you know the coax and the whole the whole uh, business so you know these sort of things really need to be uh, tweaked but they're fun to play with. You could play with these things until the cows come home. It's really fascinating. But here, you know, we're talking about, you know, rise time of, you know, 407, you know, 480. So it's under 500 picoseconds. So, you know, it's it's certainly certainly doing the business in terms of uh, uh, edge 
rise time and stuff like that you just got to tweak the thing to make it work so anyway might have to leave that uh, to another video but uh, I uh, I don't know I think we should um, at least take this thing apart and have a look at what chip it's using so let's just try and get another close-up of this before we lift it all off you can see the uh, corner pin on the right hand chip there is soldered directly down to the uh, plane down there and there's copper uh, tape over the top of the chip and you can see the wires going across and then it's got mylar on top of that or some other insulating uh, wrapper and uh, really is um, you know <laughs> quite a uh, quite a piece of work and it's going to be a shame to take it apart really but oh well we have to find out what chip this is let's lift it up and you can also see that classic tombstone capacitor there on its side that's how you uh, get really low inductance you solder it directly to the uh, copper ground plane there and then have the wire on top of it awesome well I peeled it off and uh, there's nothing on the bottom that chip at all so we're gonna have to uh, uh, flip over the other side and uh, take all that copper tape off I think and it's a rather interesting uh, build as you can see with the uh, copper tape and then what looks like the mylar over the top and then the uh, little um, enameled wire connecting uh, the various inverters in parallel so well I'm gonna have to uh, snip all the uh, enamel wire off and then uh, desolder the uh, copper tape and lift it all off all right we'll try and get this at the right angle to get it on camera sorry it could be a little bit tricky to see these silk screens it always is but there you go it's a Texas Instruments 74 LVC 04 AD I think it is there it is yep 74 LVC 04 a D date code eh who cares but there you go excellent well I hope you enjoyed that thank you very much uh, Chris and if you want to uh, build up your own one by all means um, go for it give it a try and uh, yeah it's I think it's all about the uh, getting the uh, load matching and all that right as of course is uh, obvious with uh, signal you know really high speed signal integrity stuff like this and uh, as you can see it doesn't have to be high speed in terms of frequency you know it can be a one kilohertz uh, signal it's all about the slew rate that rising edge how fast that thing is and uh, yep if you don't have the correct uh, matching on the on your uh, transmission line and your output impedances and all that sort of stuff then or, or your attenuators then you're buggered so hope you enjoyed it if you want to discuss it jump on over to the EUV blog uh, forum and if you like it give it a big thumbs up thanks Chris catch you next time